I think if you want to make something and you know what you want to make, make that thing. Just make it. The biggest barrier in your way will be time and giving yourself permission to do it. And those are not small things, but they're not insurmountable things. And I've managed to do it, so I know that you can do it too. Welcome to my car and the picnic I'm having within it. So far, and next, it's just like being on tour again, but I'm not. I'm here in Rutland in the car park of a co-op because I needed to get petrol to get home. I'm traveling home from Suffolk where my family live, back to Bristol where I live, with my little friend Albington, Alby. <laughs> Albie and I decided we wanted a little adventure on the way home so I asked the internet where I should go and thank you very much to Steve Evans and Michael Record for suggesting Rutland. I've driven past signs for Rutland many times and never stopped off because I was always on my way to somewhere else. So this morning I headed straight for Barnsdale Wood and I had no idea what was waiting in store for me. Bluebells! So many bluebells! Albs and I had a lovely walk around. We looked at the water. We walked through these beautiful, never-ending woods full of gorgeous bluebells. It was lovely. A few weeks ago, I made a community post asking you to ask me anything, and you did. So it's time for me to answer you. But first, coffee. Okay, here we go. Nick Xylus asks, if you could have just one of your songs covered by another artist, which one and who? And I'm just gonna go with the first thing that came into my mind. And the answer is, which song, any of them, who, someone young and really famous. You have my permission and warm encouragement to go forth and make my songs huge around the world because I don't mind so much if it's me singing the song as long as the songs get to travel around the world to reach the ears of people who want them and need them and love them. And of course, I would get paid and I wouldn't be the person getting recognised in the street. So yeah, any of them, someone with a big audience, go for it. More coffee. Ooh. Limnetic Villains asks, you've got unlimited resources and you decide to make your own musical instrument. What would it be? What would it be called? And what would it look like? And what unique features would it have? I don't know. I've never thought about making my own musical instrument. And that's weird because I know a man called Thomas Truax who makes his own musical instruments. Fantastic musician. I'll put a link to his work in the description box as well. And even though I know Thomas Truax, I've played with him a few times, we've hung out a little bit, and I find him to be a really inspiring character, I didn't go away from his show thinking, now I'm going to make my own musical instrument. I just thought his were really cool. So I don't know. I honestly think I have everything I need. I love guitars, I love ukuleles, I love loop pedals, and I love synths. I think I'm good. Good question though. Thank you for the question. Sean Hortley asks, when creating videos, what sort of litmus test do you use to determine if an idea you have should become a video for your channel? That's a great question. I have various lists, both paper and electronic, as well as a spreadsheet full of YouTube video ideas. And I add to these all the time. If a video idea doesn't fall under the categories I've set out for my channel, then it's really easy for me to say I'm not gonna do that one. And the two overarching categories I'm using for my channel at the moment are creativity and mindful productivity. So you'll notice that everything I post has something to do with at least one of those things, if not both of them. I know there are lots of ways to set your videos up for more success on YouTube, and that's something I'm working at doing in terms of thumbnails and titles and things like that. But at the moment, while I'm slowly growing my channel and getting used to a workflow of creating and uploading a video every single week, ultimately I'm prioritising the videos I'm really excited to make at the moment. Albie's having a drink, <laughs> if you wonder what this, that sound was. Of course, I don't want to get so caught up in prioritising the next weekly video that I don't think longer term. So I do try to plan a couple of months ahead and then I just see, see what happens. Check out Sean's channel as well and I'll put a link in the description below to that. I love his videos. Ellie asks, how do you come up with not only good lyrics to write, but the music to fit them to? First of all, thank you for the compliment. 
Thank you for saying my lyrics are good. I am very proud of my lyrics and um, I think that of all of the things in a song, lyrics can be the thing that we just don't really listen to, unless they're bad, maybe. A song is the sum of its parts. It's the melody, it's the lyrics, it's the music, it's the, the whole thing around it. So how do I come up with good lyrics to write, to start with? This can happen in various ways, but most of the time, for me, songwriting comes from a little gem of an idea, whether that's a word or a phrase or a line of lyrics I've written, whether it's a guitar riff I start coming up with, or a chord sequence, or something else musical, just a little snippet of an idea that comes into my head, or a vocal melody that comes into my head. And it's usually not a very long snippet, but it's just the start of something. And then when I sit and start working on that something, it will lead to the next something, and then something something starts to, and then something starts to form and coalesce. And then at that point, once there's a bit of a melody going, a little bit of music going in a kind of symbiotic way, then quite often some words and phrases will start popping into the kind of banana, I call them banana lyrics, the la la na ma na 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 banana na na lyrics that happen as I'm trying to come up with a melody over a piece of music or something. And that's when I start writing some of those down and I would have pressed record on my phone already because my memory sucks and I don't want to miss anything or lose anything. I'm not someone who writes pages and pages of lyrics and then that's the fully formed song and I cram that into some sort of melody. I've never worked that way. It's always a bit of everything and it's a collage that I build upon as I go. And of course the music to the song might be very, very, very basic to start with, just chords or just a little bit, a few notes and stuff. And then once I start to record the demo into my computer, that's when I can start coming up with different parts. So with many of my musical arrangements, the synth lines might happen at the very last minute once everything else is done. With the most recent album I've been working on, which is the Obey Robots album, I was talking to Rat a lot about how song arrangements are like a house. You need the foundations, then you need the walls, and then you need the roof, the roof, and the plumbing, and the electrics, and all of that fundamental structural stuff needs to be there before you start decorating. It's not about what the colour of the wallpaper is going to be, it's, it's, it's the supporting wall in there yet. So I tend to leave all of the decoration till the end now. I make sure that the melody, the meaning, the feeling, the emotions, all of that stuff's there the stuff that's going to really get you, the stuff that really gets me. I make sure that's there first and then proceed from there. Aid Rumbold asks, if you could play any venue in the world, which would you choose? Thank you for your question, Aid. I have no idea which one venue I would like to play. I've played a lot of venues that I'd like to go back to and headline myself. For instance, Shepherd's Bush Empire was my favourite one in London. But you know, Sydney Opera House is pretty sweet. I'd love to play there. If we're really dreaming, why not? Um, I don't know. To me, the best venue is full of people who know my music and want to come and listen to some songs and have a bit of a chat and be in this beautiful, unique, one night only community of music lovers. That's my perfect venue and that can be absolutely anywhere. Mount Prospect One asks, who would your dream collab be? I'm going to say this again, I've said this so many times over the years, my dream collaborations, there are probably three. One, Massive Attack, right? Wouldn't that be brilliant? Do you know them? Could you ask them? I'd love that. The very first song that I performed on vocals to my school that wasn't like a school concert thing was Unfinished Sympathy by Massive Attack. And I wrote out the string parts for some people to play and I did the vocals and someone did some DJing, I think. And I wish there was a VHS somewhere of this and there probably is. If anyone out there <laughs> sees this and knows me from school and has that somehow, I'd love to see that, I really would. Although in my mind, it was just this imp incredible performance and, and, and maybe it wasn't as incredible as I remember. But so yeah, Massive Attack, also The Prodigy, one of my favorite bands ever, and Uncle. I think it's time to finally make this happen. And if it does happen, we have to thank Mount Prospect One. Thank you. Keymas asks, when you decided to be independent as a musician, how that plan slash dream changed to where you are now? Any regrets or advice you could share for people wanting to start something, but are afraid they can't meet their own expectations to realize that? Hmm. When I started making music independently, the reason I wasn't interested in trying to get help with it was because I had spent the last at least five if not ten years playing in other people's bands as a hired session musician and so I had experience of seeing how their careers went, who was involved, what went well, what didn't go well um, from a fairly inside position and nothing I saw made me want to get people involved in my project and looking back now I am so proud of younger Laura for making that decision so early on. 
But yeah, so after my second album came out, I did start thinking about ways to try and get some help because it's really difficult to feel like you're making progress in something, um, in music especially, when the sort of music industry and the world at large don't know who you are. Because so much of success in the music business is perceived to be people knowing your name, writing about you, saying nice things about you, and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's a whole series of videos I could make about that kind of stuff, and I, I do have plans to talk about it in the future. But that's just some broad strokes for you. Um, my efforts in that area were not particularly successful, by the way. And while I don't regret doing it because I learned a lot, I wish I could have that time back and I wish I could have that money back, more to the point. Because basically it just showed me again and again that my initial ethos was correct. So, fast forward to now, present day Laura, and I have no desire to team up with anyone. I know the value and the worth of what I make. I know how to run my creative business well. And I know that from the finance point of view, having a label involved, having a manager involved, they would have to be so brilliant at every single aspect of what they say they can do to make it worth my while even having a meeting about it. They'd have to be the very best. And fundamentally, the issue with trying to get involved with labels and managers and la la la, all those things, are not even just that they might not give you the thing you think you're gonna get from them, and probably won't, but it relies on a kind of pick me, please pick me attitude, which I fully left behind a very long time ago. Um, I don't want to live my life that way. And in fact, that goes back to 2009, Laura, recording my first album, Disarm, not wanting anyone to stick their oar in and tell me how they thought my music should go. And everything I've done since then that strayed away from that idea has just pulled me further and further back to it. As for advice, I think if you want to make something and you know what you want to make, make that thing. Just make it. The biggest barrier in your way will be time and giving yourself permission to do it. And those are not small things, but they're not insurmountable things. And I've managed to do it, so I know that you can do it too. Mike Wheeler asks, do you mix your stuff before mastering or do you get a third party to do that? Um, up until now, I've always had someone else do the mixing of my albums for me. I say up until this day because I've recently made the big decision that it's time for me to get much more involved in my album mixing. So I mix all my demos, I mix all of the stuff that goes out on Bandcamp between albums, but now I want to get really involved in the album mixing because even with the Obey Robot stuff, I've been mixing everything in Logic to make it sound how I want so that I can explain that without having to do it in words because that just never works. And honestly, before now, I haven't had much interest in doing the mixing part. I like the idea of a fresh set of ears on the mix, bringing their artistry and their techniques to it in a way that I can't. But then I was like, the only reason I can't is because I haven't spent time on that. And yet in the last six months, I've just got really interested in the idea of doing that as well. So I'm gonna be doing some mixing training soon and just working steadily towards being able to mix my own records. And I'm excited about that. Thank you for the question. Martin White asks, what new recording artists do you rate? Who do I really like? Wet Leg, Wallace and Faye Webster. Broken Down Golf Cart asks, what's your at home setup, interface, amps, etc." I'm gonna be annoying and put a pin in that one because I'm gonna make a video about my setup and it's gonna be with you in a few weeks, I promise. So watch out for that one. I will show you it all, explain it all. It's very basic, very affordable, very achievable for anybody. Broken Down Golf Cart makes excellent music and animated videos and I'll put a link to her stuff in the description box as well. Finally, Clark Worthy 3 asks, best Bristol act, yourself not included? Why can't I include myself? Hmm, well, I don't think of myself as a Bristol act anyway. I'm international. But uh, best Bristol act, I can't say one. That's ridiculous. I'll tell you four, three, it's kind of four. Silver Stairs of Ketchikan, and that's Charlie Romaine from Thoughtform Ziz's solo project, Emily Breeze, and Milky. I'll put links to all of these people in the description box below. Do check them out, they're fantastic. I'll remind you that I hate most music. So when I like something, I feel very confident that I can recommend them to you as well. Thanks so much for sending in your questions. I'll do this again quite soon, so feel free to comment below with any questions that lead off from the questions that were answered in this one or any other questions about music, video making, all the things that I do. I genuinely love to hear from you and I really appreciate you getting involved. Right, it's time for me and Albie to drive back to Bristol now, listening to podcasts and eating a whisper gold. That's just for me.
not for Abby. Thank you for watching this video, you are ace. This channel is very slowly approaching 2,000 subscribers and that is blowing my mind. Thank you so much for being one of them. And if you're not, you know what to do. YouTube thinks you'll like this video and I think you're gonna like this video. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done that already and I will see you in the next video. Take care. Thank you.